Okay, I got a, uh, a short presentation, uh, very short case history. I mentioned this one before, a Jadwin Dam. It's a, it's a core facility. So the objectives of this presentation, there was a flaw that was left in this embankment during construction. So we're gonna go through that. We're gonna look at the existing conditions of the embankment and, um, and how we came up with some uh, feasible modifications, as well as looking at the, those modifications, those alternatives, and why we selected the one that we did. And then I mentioned this yesterday, the importance of, of establishing design criteria early on. So I'm gonna go through how that uh, uh, impacted this project and, uh, and what, which criteria that we selected and the reason why. And then this has been emphasized several times to use case histories to inform your current design. So if you had um, a, a case that was similar to this, you could compare it and, um, and be able to use it. So the project is located north Eastern Pennsylvania, about 35 miles northeast of Scranton, Pennsylvania. So uh, the dam was constructed from 1957 to 1960. It's a, it's a zoned earth embankment dam, and the uh, purpose of a dam is flood control. Uh, it's a dry dam. It doesn't normally hold any water. So whatever inflows come in, uh, pass through the outlet. So here's a cross section of the embankment, typical cross section. This is the core material. The core material actually consists of, of 12 inch minus material that is mostly a, uh, a silty, a sand and silt with some, also some gravel. And it, it typically uh, contains about 15 to 20% fine. So uh, percent passing the 200. And then immediately downstream of that is the transition zone, which actually is described as being earth fill with boulders. So kind of a wide range of material. And then immediately downstream of that is a, is a rock fill shell material. Underneath the rock fill is a, uh, is a blanket, um, a filter blanket that's a foot and a half thick. And then there's also a downstream berm. And that was placed, that was rock fill. Uh, if the spillway operates and it overflows, this provides some additional protection for, uh, for erosion of the toe. <clears throat> also, on the upstream side, there's a seepage berm that was placed. Uh, a lot of these materials from upstream and downstream berm were from the spillway excavation when the dam was built. So they, they lengthen the entire seepage path underneath the embankment. And I should have mentioned to start with, this is on a soil foundation. Um, it is on uh, glacial deposits and alluvial deposits. So the upstream slope, that slopes at, uh, at three to one at the, at the, uh, near the, the bottom. And then towards the top, it, it uh, breaks at, at, at two and a half to one. So 2.5 horizontal to one vertical. The, uh, the downstream slope, uh, the most of the slope is, is two and a half to one and the uh, upper portion of the slope is two to one. During construction, the winter of 57 to 58, um, they didn't complete the embankment. They had a winter shutdown. This is Northern Pennsylvania. So the, the embankment was about halfway over the valley section when they have to stop constru construction. So in order to divert flows during construction, they put in this diversion channel. And then they also, they protected, so here's the embankment. They protected that embankment with, uh, with uh, rock fill. And this would have been that transition zone material on this downstream side. And this is looking upstream. And then they also protected the, the end slope where it, where it uh, uh, ended about halfway across the valley with, a, uh, with riprap, with rock fill. And they also put a berm along the toe as well as to protect the issue was when they started construction back up in the spring of 1958, all that material was left in place. And then they just built the embankment on top of that. So we had a flaw right through the, the core. This is the core of the dam right here, that, that 12 inch minus with 15 to 20% fines. Um, and uh, so 
I, I'm not sure what the rationale was at the time, but so now we, we fast forward, and then in, in 1968, um, it was determined that some additional piezometers needed to be added at the site. So when they did that, they hit some, some large material that was, uh, that was left that, you know, during the drilling operation and decided that they were going to do some additional investigations. So we were talking about a calyx hole. So they, they uh, drilled a 36 inch diameter calyx hole with a casing that had some windows in the side of the casing and, and lowered a geologist down in the hole. Um, and uh, some of these were what was plucked out of there. That looks like almost a, a foot and a half to two foot rock. There's a six foot rule right there. So they definitely discovered that there was a flaw left in the embankment. Um, and our, the drilling work kind of confirmed that. And also there was uh, some, uh, some uh, permeability testing, in situ permeability testing that uh, showed a, a great loss of water. And then during drilling, uh, water and air was used and they lost a, a lot of water as well. So, so in, in 1970, the fix was, uh, well, let's grout that zone. Let's try to grout that up. And they did that and they felt that was successful. Um, they were tracking grout quantities and whatnot and uh, carefully mapping those and felt that was a su successful solution to, uh, to the problem. I'm fast forwarding again. There was a risk assessment that started in 2010 um, that determined that we had to kind of look into this issue a bit more um, from a risk assessment standpoint uh, to see you know, what, kind of, uh, what kind of problems and, and high, how, how high the risk was and if it met our, our tolerable guidelines. So, um, so based on that, um, that risk assessment, we came up with this risk driving failure mode, which is internal erosion along a construction defect. So when they placed that, when they placed that rock, that rock fill on that end slope, and it was through the core, there was an uncompacted zone underneath that. That was never removed. They put the, the fill on top of it. So Ed was talking about uh, low density zones. So that was the, the, uh, the, the point where internal erosion could occur right through that zone. Even if we had all the voids filled with, with, uh, with, um, in the rock fill with, with grout, we would still have that uncompacted zone underneath. Because of course, what they should have done, obviously is take the rock off, prepare that surface, mix that back up because it went through freeze thaw during the winter time, um, and, then, uh, and then moisture conditioned it, and then placed a compacted fill on top of that. So that wasn't done. But so the failure mode is as the, as the water surface um, increases to, to where this break and slope is, um, where the, uh, the top of the berm um, flow would come through this area, and, and what's shown in green is, if you can imagine this, is the, 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 the rock fill slope is projected into the page. So you can kind of picture it sloping out in this direction where that rock fill slope is. So the green is, uh, is the ungrouted rock fill. This kind of pink area up here is the estimation of where they grouted that rock fill during 1970. And then the area right below it was, uh, was uh, ungrouted. So as the pool comes up, flow goes through this area, it kind of drops down uh, through that transition zone, which I said was earth fill and boulders, and it's gonna be trans uh, transpending those fines along that uncompacted zone underneath the rock, and then transported into this rock fill. So if that transport was occurring, then you would really never know that because this rock fill is buried deep in the dam, you wouldn't know that, that that failure mode was occurring until you start to see deformation and sinkholes on your embankment. So that drove, uh, as far as the um, risk assessment goes, it was found that, it, that, that the risk was unacceptable. Uh, it did not meet uh, uh, risk tolerance guidelines from uh, life safety, loss of life, and uh, also from a um, uh, economic standpoint, so it was determined that that uh, additional, we're going to go into a modification study, design and construction. So I just wanted to show you this to g get you a better understanding, again, of the flaw. So this is plan view, profile across the valley. Here is the diversion channel. 
upstream to downstream. The green is just like the green in the other photo. That's the ungrouted uh, rock fill. This pink area in the center, that's where they grouted. And then in, uh, in, again, in profile, uh, the yellow line on top is the winter shutdown line. You can see there was that slope. And then they didn't quite top off the embankment here. There was a top of grade right on this line. And then here's the approximate un uh, grouted zone. And then there's that, that uh, low density zone uh, below that, that riprap interface. Going into the modification study, um, there was really five alternatives that were evaluated. We always evaluate a future without action as well as complete dam removal. Those were not considered. Uh, it, was, it was felt that we had to do something because the risk was too high and complete dam removal, it still had provided uh, flood benefits. That's what the project was built for, was uh, flood control. So then we looked at, uh, the team looked at three different alternatives, a partial length, partial depth cutoff wall, uh, an upstream impervious barrier uh, of the other two, um, you know, the, uh, the, the partial cutoff as well as the impervious berm, uh, at a more uh, cost effective, and it also had um, less construction risk associated with that. So that was, that was selected as the plan. Um, and then as we got into final design, we looked at different options of, of, uh, of that upstream impervious barrier. So uh, there were three options that were evaluated, uh, put in a concrete slab, uh, put in compacted clay, take the riprap off, put compacted clay um, as a barrier, put your riprap and bedding back on, uh, and then, uh, or put in a buried geomembrane liner, which would have been below, again, the riprap. So it was decided to use the geomembrane liner, and, and the rationale behind that is the concrete slabs have operation maintenance issues. They crack, they move, um, and the joints can leak and, and through cracks. Uh, the clay, this is a dry dam. The clay can desiccate and you can still get flow through that crack, um, particularly because it's a dry dam and it's not going to be under a pool at all. So it was determined that the upstream impervious barrier was going to be a geomembrane system. Starting uh, into final design, we needed to, to uh, take a look at um, the extent of this area a little bit closer in terms of how, how much, how uh, far spread was that temporary rock fill on the slope and that rock fill berm that was along um, the slope as well. So, have to get a little creative here, but this is a, this is a, a construction photo that was taken looking towards the left abutment. So that end slope is right here, and there's a diversion canal. And there was still a couple of houses that were out there. So we used various features um, to then superimpose this on like an isometric view of the embankment. So you can see here's the embankment here. Um, so this is the downstream slope, and this, this uh, white area is where the estimated limits of that rock fill were. And this would have been that transition zone. Um, here is the diversion canal. This is the upstream side here. Here's the diversion canal. We also located, it looked like there was a, uh, a temporary ramp that came up. We kind of located that because we were trying to just get this sort of geo position so we could figure out again uh, how, how extensive this, this uh, rock fill was because we needed to make sure the liner system covered that and particularly in the upstream direction as well as laterally right to left. And if you look, it's kind of pretty vague in here. It's a little slight, but that little tan area right there is what we consider to be the extent of the rock fill berm at the toe of, that I described earlier. So taking another, taking the, 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 the cross section and superimposing that cross section on another photo that taken during construction, you can see here's the dam crest. Here are the slopes, here's the berm on the downstream side, here's the upstream side, and you can clearly see the rock fill berm in here. And then again, we kind of superimpose that uh, back onto the cross section, and that these red lines are what we felt were about the, the limits of how far that rock fill berm went upstream. Because again, we had to determine uh, where that was. And um, it, was, it was about, it was, upstream of where 
where that break and slope was of, of where the berm was. So again, that was uh, one of the critical areas that we had to determine that extent. So I, I mentioned about design criteria early on in the project. So we, we determined there was really uh, three MFRs, three memos for records that should be prepared that really drove the entire design of this project. One of them was, do we need to have a seepage collection system immediately downstream of that geomembrane? Uh, Bureau of Reclamation has done a, a few projects using geomembranes with a pool for water supply. Uh, and they've usually put, a, a typical practice is to put a seepage collection system immediately downstream. Um, in this case, that, that was the first MFR. The second one was to determine what these limits of the geomembrane system were going to be, how wide it was going to be, and how far upstream. Uh, and then the third was really the stability of the entire liner system. So all the a mixture of various geosynthetics that had to be used to provide a, a stable uh, long-term and, and short-term during construction with equipment loads on it. So that first, that first uh, memo for record on the um, seepage collection system, it was decided not to put one in. We, we were gonna extend this, uh, this seepage length you know, for a very long distance um, and, uh, and also the, the PMF for this project from, from that break and slope of the, of the upstream, uh, from the upstream berm, where that upstream berm uh, um, intersection point is, from there, the, the PMF was only a nine day duration to go up and come back down to the elevation. So our loading was really short. So we felt that we didn't need the collection system because of that reason. And if the liner system had some pinholes in it, it would be very limited flow. Um, so it wouldn't have much to collect anyway, and it wouldn't have a long duration of flow. So that, that was decided not to put it in, and it really didn't affect the, 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 uh, the risk assessment on the project in terms of lowering the risk. It really didn't have an impact on that. Um, for the extent of the liner system, let's say from the right to left direction, and just to give you an idea, this is, this is, the, this is the dam crest here, this is the upstream slope, and this is the area where they grouted in 1970, right here. So we evaluated the, made an estimate of the, of the hydraulic conductivity of the core, and, and then the team determined that um, they had kind of a crude factor of safety. They looked at the seepage path length, length with the membrane in place, and that seepage path length was to get to the flaw, and, um, and then the, the length without the liner system. So they just took the ratio of those two. Um, and as it turned out, from based on the permeability and that, that uh, duration of nine days of the PMF, our penetration into the embankment was estimated to be like 11 feet. So it wasn't very high, but again, that's, you know, permeabilities have a wide range, of course. So we came up, the team came up with this crude factor of safety using a 400 foot length of right to left of about 14. Um, and that's about an order of magnitude in terms of permeability. So I think that that was, uh, that's why um, uh, that was used, you know, just kind of based on uh, our best estimate of, uh, of permeability. Then for the ex upstream extent, we used the same similar procedure, went as far upstream as we could, because if we went further upstream, we started to get into environmental issues into the pool area. But the factor safety for that was about seven, and the um, hydraulic gradient uh, was uh, determined, was estimated to be about 0.06. So it was very low. So we felt that that was a, a, a large enough extent of the, uh, of the entire system that there wasn't, that there wouldn't be an issue uh, related to that. So this is, I know this is a, try to get more, a different image, but I, I anyway, I, I think that you'll, you'll understand, you know, you can't read it, all the detail here. Maybe if you blow it up on your screen, you can. But um, so this, now, this is a final design drawing. And uh, the features I just want to point out here, um, here's the dam crest. The, um, the anchor trench is going to be excavated just below the dam crest to put the geosynthetics in. Uh, all that existing riprap that's on the upstream slope 
was is going to be removed and uh, a, a liner system would be installed on a prepared subgrade and then that liner system is going to go all the way out there's a break and slope with that upstream berm we're going to go all the way out to that 150 feet into another anchor trench way out here and Wanted to show you a blow up of the dam crest and a couple of features to show you here. This came right from the, the design drawings as well. Um, from here is the here's the existing dam crest and here's the existing downstream slope. So we as we're excavating about six feet deep down to this elevation, which we then are going to we're going to excavate horizontally out, so to speak, out to uh, through that transition zone and out to the downstream slope, and we created about a 20 foot foot wide hull road right there because all the geosynthetics are going to be basically rolled into this anchor trench and then rolled down the slope so we needed access to the top of the slope to ease construction uh, this anchor trench also needed to be excavated to provide pullout resistance uh, for the liner system and it was decided uh, based on the construction loads and it's a pretty steep slope for geosynthetics so this is gonna be filled with lean concrete. And then one inch minus soil is gonna be placed on top of that. This is before any equipment loads are gonna come out here on the slope um, to provide a, a more, um, uh, more pull out resistance because of the overburden load on top of that anchor trench. So, so, uh, so the geosynthetic system, we've got a, on a prepared subgrade, we have uh, uh, geomembrane liner, which is actually a, 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 a super grip net, it's called, which has a much higher friction angle, if people are familiar with geomembranes, than a textured geomembrane. So, um, and the reason for that, to use that product on the upper part of the slope, where it was steeper, uh, is that we couldn't get stability during construction with a small piece of equipment. So we had to to, to place material on this on this slope, and I'll go over that in a second. Uh, but in order to maintain a reasonable factor of safety, which was driving the design, uh, we had to use this super grip net. On top of the super grip net, uh, there will be a, a, a geotextile, and then a number 57 stone, which is a coarse aggregate for concrete, will be placed on top of that. And then a, a, um, a geogrid, uh, will be placed on, on top of that one foot layer of, of 57 stone, then another layer of 57 stone, then bedding, and then the riprap on top of that. So the minimum factor of safety that was used for that critical case of putting like a D4 dozer to, to push that number 57 stone on the, on the slope, we use a minimum factor of safety of 1.25, which is real, pretty standard. The dozer couldn't move it will have it has to uh, not accelerate and whatnot and not turn but it uh, but that was considered to be an acceptable factor of safety so that that's what really kind of drove the design to put the uh, geo grid as well as that super grip net so the project was uh, just awarded this past summer for five million dollars and uh, uh, it started in july and here's just a a photo just taken about a month ago um, this is the 400 foot wide area on the upstream slope. There's the break and slope for the berm. Uh, and they're excavating the riprap and, and uh, moving it in the downstream direction. And, um, and the project is, looks like at this point, it could start a little late. It may end up, uh, right now scheduled will be completed uh, early in the summer, so. Okay, thank you.